The Calb Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to the 100th edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb and our subject tonight, we the people. That's right, those three words, top of the Constitution, we the people. Questions heard very often these days relate directly to the U.S. Constitution, such as, are we in a constitutional crisis, or are we heading toward one? How would we define a constitutional crisis? And if we could define it, what would we do about it? Put bluntly, do we as a people have the wisdom and the mechanism to manage our political problems as they are manifest these days. I don't promise answers to these questions, but we'll try. And toward that end, we've assembled a trio of experts, starting to my far right, which is a matter of geography only, <laughs> uh, Pete Williams, who has covered the Justice Department and the Supreme Court for NBC News since 1993. He's been a journalist since 1974. That's more than 45 years. He also worked as Pentagon spokesman for Defense Secretary Dick Cheney during the Persian Gulf War. He's won many awards for his reporting. To my left, Jonathan Turley, a distinguished law professor at the George Washington University and a legal affairs analyst for both CBS News and the BBC. He's written extensively on constitutional law and legal theory he was today a witness before the House Judiciary Committee on the possible impeachment of President Trump. And to my immediate right, Nina Totenberg, the legal affairs correspondent for National Public Radio, where she's been working since 1975. Her reporting on the Supreme Court has been widely acknowledged to be among the very best. She's been honored seven times by the American Bar Association. So, welcome, friends and neighbors, and let's get started. I think we can all agree that everyone of the right, the left, the center these days admits that we, the people, are politically polarized more deeply, perhaps, than at any other time in recent decades, also paralyzed in our legislative ability to get anything done. Arguments between Democrats and Republicans about President Trump's policies and actions have risen to the level of another drive to launch a president, the third in my lifetime. It looks like a constitutional crisis, but are we in fact in one or heading toward one? And I'd like to start with Pete Williams, then go to Jonathan and Nita. Pete. The answer is no, we're not in a constitutional crisis. I mean, I'm not sure anybody really knows what one is to, to answer your second question because the scholars, I'm sure Jonathan would be among them, uh, are uh, divided about what is. To me, it's when, we, when the Constitution doesn't provide an answer, that there's some crisis and we look to the Constitution and we don't find the answer. None of the things that have happened so far have been extra constitutional, as a matter of fact, what happened today is members of Congress following the text of the Constitution that lays out the duties of the House and presumably early next year the duties of the Senate in conducting a trial if in fact the President is impeached. So the answer to, I think the answer to the question is no, there is no constitutional crisis. This President is giving the Constitution a good workout. We are speaking the term emoluments for the first time in many years. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton gave the Constitution a good workout, so did Richard Nixon, but that doesn't mean it's a crisis. Okay, thank you. Jonathan, your view, please. I agree. Uh, you know, this is a Constitution that's not particularly poetic. Um, if you want to see a poetic Constitution, you go to France. They had a lot of practice because they had so many of them. Uh, <laughs> 
but this is a, this constitution was written by the ultimate wonk. You know, James Madison uh, was a colossal geek, and um, it was built. It was built to survive, and it has. And it, I always find it strange because it sort of borders on defamation when people talk about constitutional crisis. This country has been why defamation? I don't well, understand. because it says something about the constitution that is just facially untrue. This country has gone through crises that would grind most into a fine pumice, and we've survived. And we've survived largely because of that document. But you can have a crisis and survive it. But this is what the document was written for. You know, it wasn't just written for times like this, it was written in times like this. I mean, people always think that they're the first to have deeply divisive politics. They forget that people like Thomas Jefferson referred to the Federalist uh, administration before him is the reign of the witches. And as I mentioned to the, the members today, you know, people talk about them wanting to, acting like they want to kill each other. Back then, they were actually trying to kill each other. I mean, that was the Sedition Act. You were trying to actually kill the people you disagree with. So this Constitution's gone through a lot. It was designed for bad times, not good. Okay. Nina, you agree? Not entirely. Um, I, I had the, have had the privilege, I guess, in the last week of working on a, a retrospective about impeachment. And of course, there really had not been an impeachment effort when Richard Nixon uh, was the subject of an impeachment inquiry in 1974. There had not been one since Andrew Johnson. And impeachment was very much in disrepute. And I, in listening to the audio of what happened after the Saturday Night Massacre. Uh, news reporters and commentators all called it a constitutional crisis because the notion of impeachment was not something that was really acceptable. We'd had a lot of threats of impeachment, but minor league threats. They'd never managed to be much of anything. And then suddenly, we had what appeared to be a genuine problem that people in the country couldn't see their way around. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> since then, we've had first the Nixon attempted impeachment. Of course, he would have been impeached and removed from office, and he resigned. And then the Clinton impeachment, and then he was acquitted, essentially, in the Senate not removed from office, and now we have the attempt to impeach <coughs> President Trump. And when you examine those three, you see that a kind of an arc of a political crisis, not so much a constitutional crisis, but a political crisis, between a time in the Nixon impeachment where <coughs> there really was an attempt at consensus, and there really were parties that moved from left to right. So you had conservative <coughs> Democrats and you had moderate Republicans. Both of those are close to extinct. The parties are now at each other's throats. Um, and the kind of display that we saw in Nixon is nowhere to be seen now. Even the Clinton impeachment was sort of a midpoint in that arc of 45 years between genuine attempt to deal with the problem and, and, and members of Congress who were deeply under stress. Walter Flowers of Alabama <laughs> developed a bleeding ulcer. Tom Railsback, who ended up leading Republicans privately to vote for some of the articles of impeachment, was lost his voice. Some think it was psychological because Richard Nixon had sent federal agents to help find his daughter a short time before. I mean, th these were cataclysmic times. Jonathan and I were talking about this. The Clinton impeachment was not like what you saw today. It was somewhere in between. But what we're having, it seems to me, is a bit of difficulty in defining what a constitutional crisis would be. Um, you're saying it may be more of a political crisis. Yes, that's what I think than we're a constitutional in right now. one. But but please educate me. Uh, when Congress subpoenas witnesses and documents from the executive branch, and the White House says no, no witnesses, no documents, President Trump says again and again, it's all a hoax, a witch hunt, 
Is this deepening deadlock, if it is not a constitutional crisis, then do we all settle for it being a political crisis like any other, and you walk away from it? Are you all saying that nothing special is happening right now? No, I think maybe a constitutional crisis is uh, when you, there's a crisis and you have to turn to the Constitution for the answer. Uh, <laughs> but that's what they're trying to do now, Pete. They're right. trying to turn to it. Yes, but, you know, so actually, you know, President Trump is not the first president to say that White House officials are absolutely immune from congressional subpoena. This but is he a, is the first who is not allowing them to appear before Congress. In an impeachment proceeding. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, and, and I, I'm sure Professor Witterly would say that's because the, the House has stepped on the accelerator and is getting ahead of the courts. But uh, the theory that he is propounding, well, I won't answer his question for him. He's even <laughs> no, though, you're doing great. Even, I... though, in case you didn't, <laughs> even though you didn't, in case you didn't know, we talk about the Constitution. The Eighth Amendment is cruel and unusual punishment, which is what he's subjected to today for <laughs> eight and a half hours of testimony. Jonathan? If the court, let me ask a question. If the courts decide that a president must produce the witnesses and the documents, is there anything then that stops the president from complying? I, no, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'll, the, the question is a good one in the sense of uh, the presupposition that a court has looked at this and has issued yes. an order. One of the issues that is the greatest uh, divide, it certainly was a divide between uh, the, uh, among the panel today, was, is really the benefit of going to court. My, my complaint uh, involving this inquiry is not that, that President Trump cannot be impeached for abuse of power. I've always said that he can. I've also always said that he can be impeached for a quid pro quo in Ukraine. I think those are unassailable facts. My problem is how this is being done. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the articles that they are talking about is to impeach him for failing to turn over these witnesses and documents. Mm -hmm. uh, and this gets to an issue that was raised in Article 3 of Nixon. That is, can you impeach a president who's gone to court? And Nixon went to court. Um, in this case, so has the Trump administration. But more importantly, Congress has never subpoenaed these key witnesses. So in my Senator, view- that, Excuse me. Hasn't Congress subpoenaed the Secretary of State? The, in terms Secretary of the impeachment- Secretary of Energy, he's, they have. They're not in court. They actually agree. They've said that they won't subpoena John Bolton. They won't subpoena these They said these no one Bolton, witnesses. but I think they... They yeah. subpoenaed Pompeo. But, they, but, but the thing is, they hmm? said they won't wait. They won't litigate the issue of the subpoenas. And they haven't issued one to John Bolton, which is a mystery to me, as well as these other witnesses. Um, and, and they have said, we're not going to wait for the courts. And I think that's a serious problem, uh, because you do have a... a an obstruction of justice case. If you get a court order and the president doesn't obey it, and I, that's one of the reasons I think this is premature and it's designed to fail in the Senate, that it could be much, much stronger. And the problem that I have is that fast and narrow is not a good way to build an impeachment, yeah, right. but more importantly, it's gonna tear this country <clears throat> apart. One of the benefits of Nixon um, was a certain period of maturation and saturation. The public essentially caught up to Congress. Congress convinced them. But also, you know, he'd just been reelected. He had just been reelected, Nixon had. And it took years. And in fact, it was not a congressional subpoena that did him in, it was the special prosecutor's subpoena that did him what, in. Well, what would happen, Nina, if on the Supreme Court level, I asked the question before on courts, uh, too broad a word perhaps, but jump to the Supreme Court. Supposing the Supreme Court, which is apparently the destination in the White House's judgment for a lot of these issues, are going to go to the Supreme Court. Well, three of them there now. And that, right. What if the Supreme Court ruled, Mr. President, you've got to turn this stuff over? And he said, no. Where is there in the U.S. government or who in the U.S. government then has the power to say to a president, hey, buddy, you've got to do this. And well, he says, no, what in, do you have In fact, in the Nixon impeachment. No, no, now. I understand. But in fact, in the Nixon impeachment, they didn't go to court. 
The, the House Judiciary Committee didn't go to court. Leon Jaworski but and what? Archibald Cox went to court, and that was sort of on a parallel track. But Congress never went to the court, and I actually think that probably, if it ever went to court, it would take a very long time. But I think it's likely that even this very conservative court would say, impeachment isn't our business, it's your business. I'm not too sure how long it would take. That's part of my complaint. They, they burned two months so far. Uh, the decision in Don McGahn's uh, ruling, that was a non-expedited case. Um, if you look at Nixon, they did expedite Nixon, and they did fast work at the end. Um, they would do it again. And, and I think you could get some decisions, certainly on the trial level and the appellate level. I actually think on the Supreme Court level, they would expedite as well. I think, too, think that the 5-4 breakdown in the court would almost predetermine the outcome? I've always said I, I thought that Trump would lose these fights. Remember, they were unanimous in the Nixon case. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was the Nixon case, but I'm right. talking about what would be your judgment now? You think it would be 5-4, unanimous? Not necessarily, no. And I think the court would try everything it could not to be that way. Mm -hmm. To answer two of your questions, one is, could, a president be, could this president be impeached even though he's stiffing the Congress on all the documents? I think the answer is he's about to be impeached based on <laughs> all the indications, even though he hasn't turned over all the documents. That seems to be where the, where the Democrats in Congress are headed. Uh, and secondly, if the Supreme, let's, let's take it away from President Trump and just say a president. Let's say a president uh, again, stiffed the Congress on an, on an impeachment proceeding, went to the Supreme Court, lost, and said, well, I'm still not giving them to you, then I think if, if there was ever a political division within the Congress about whether that was impeachable, I think that would, that would be a huge turning point. Meaning what exactly? A meaning, constitutional crisis? Meaning that, that, that <laughs> I think that would, no, I think that would, uh, that would change a lot of views in Congress about whether the president was obstructing the proceedings. And do you think that the Congress would some of them change their views were that to happen? Yes. You do. Do you think that, Jonathan? I do. I think that part of the reason um, I, I'm, I'm so disappointed with how they're doing this impeachment uh, is that a court order, I mean, Nixon resigned shortly after the Supreme Court ruled against him. And the weight of the court, it wasn't that it was necessary for impeachment, but I think it was part of the reason that the public caught up. Uh, that you had the, the legitimacy of these courts saying that this is not a valid argument. I think what the Democrats are doing is they're guaranteeing they're going to leave half this country behind. And it will fail in the Senate. And our divisions will deepen and everyone will get even more angry. Um, I would prefer them to wait and build a stronger case. And they just might find that people come along. You know, I, I think, I, can I just ask a question? Yes. That sounds good, but in the McGahn case that you cited, all that they got out of the district court order was to say he had to show up. Did say he had to testify. Didn't say that the president couldn't exert executive privilege. These things, if they actually went through the lower courts like this, you could expedite them all you wanted, and you're still talking about at least a year, I think. Well, I, I think that's, I, certainly I think that's, that's, that's true. I think they could make faster work of it. I think part of the problem was that the court was taking so long on what was a very easy issue. Um, it should not have taken this long on this opinion. Quite frankly, I would have done a, a, a virtual bench ruling on this. I mean, I do not believe the immunity argument was very serious. And so I think the court hurt Congress's interest in taking so long. Uh, but it, once they get the privilege, I think it could move pretty quickly because the court can, once the court decides the first executive privilege claim, um, I think that the other courts could move quickly. I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions now, specifically on the Ukraine issue, and start with Nina. Did the president do anything that is clearly illegal, according to your reporting? Well, as... Mr. Turley once testified in the Clinton case that you don't have to do something illegal to be impeached. It has to be a high crime and misdemeanor. And what a regular person could do and would not be illegal would be illegal if a president did it. And in this case, if, as seems pretty clear from the testimony of the people who worked in the White House who did testify, if the president had, was in fact, saying to Mr. Zelensky, if you want your aid, 
you need to go to a microphone and say you're going to in investigate uh, Joe Biden's son and Burisma. Um, and those were his political enemies. And at the time this was occurring, Joe Biden was seen as the strongest likely candidate against him. So that would be illegal? Well, the question is, would it be impeachable to do something with American foreign policy that's not in the national interest, that is not in the interests of your, the, your ally, but is in your own personal political interest? Yeah, but Pete, the Republicans say that politics has always been part of the process of foreign affairs. Always been. The acting White House uh, chief of staff said that in public. And then he was sorry. <clears throat> and sorry, right. <laughs> but the, <clears throat> my point here is, um, what is such a big deal in what it is that the president did, in your judgment? Well, I'm paid not to have a judgment on things like that. No, so no, but I'm, I'm asking you to have a judgment. I, I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm going to, in the finest tradition of the National Press Club, fail to answer the question. But... Uh, <laughs> But I, I think I, I think that's I, I suspect you know the answer. It's it's to the people who are concerned about the president's conduct. It's uh, trying to get something. It's using the majesty of the office and the power of the office, not in the interest of the United States, but in his personal interest. That's the issue. If I can just uh, attach my uh, uh, answer to Nina's and say that I think this is a very interesting question, and that Jonathan spent a lot of time talking about it today. Uh, about whether the president has to commit a crime to, in order to be impeached. And, you know, having read a lot of these hypotheticals, one of the law school hypotheticals that often comes up to say the answer to that is <laughs> clearly no. <laughs> Suppose the president said, you know, uh, I want more than one wife. I'm going to Saudi Arabia and I'm going to run the presidency from there and I'll keep in touch by, by, uh, <laughs> by tweet uh, and I'll get back to you. Uh, that's clearly not illegal. That's a good idea, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly not illegal, but I don't think anyone would doubt that it would be an impeachable offense. Jonathan, question for you is, uh, we've heard a great deal that the presidency itself, as compared with the other two branches of government, has climbed to a position of enormous power, perhaps more than it's had in a very, very long time. We've always wanted to have a balance among the three branches. In your judgment, has the presidency risen to a point of power that it represents now a threat to the actual balancing of our government? I think it does. Um, I, I'm a critic of the expansion of the executive branch. Um, I'm a typical Madisonian scholar in that sense. I tend to favor Congress and disputes with the White House. and. Um, the, the, it's interesting, when Madison uh, uh, worked on the Constitution, he incorporated language that was sort of Newtonian. Uh, he was fascinated by Newtonian physics, which was the hot thing of the day. And he, when you go back and look at his material when he studied at Princeton, there's this incredible chart that he did, which, by the way, is one of those moments where you just really hate James Madison, uh, because it's this elaborate chart with hundreds of planets and, and heavenly bodies. And he did this because, well, he wanted to. And it, it, is, it is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. But he was fascinated by this concept of bodies locked in orbits. And when you look at some of his writings and from the Constitutional Convention, a lot of this Newtonian stuff comes out. He viewed the three branches like bodies locked in an orbit. They had to be equal, and they had to basically have inverse control over each other. But if it goes out, is there a danger? To there the is system? a danger. If one of those bodies becomes larger, you can't maintain that orbit. And I think that in the last 30 years, particularly, You've seen the rise of this sort of uber presidency. And it's not Democrat or Republican. Oh, Barack Obama was off the charts in terms of his claims of presidential authority. So was George Bush. All of them, if something happens when they go into that building. But you know, there is a school of thought that says the reason is that the Congress doesn't do anything <clears throat> anymore. And that's why the presidency is assuming these powers. And, and it's, the only, it's the only part of the government 
uh, uh, that's actually doing something. Yeah, and I think that's the view of people like Bill Barr. You know, Bill and I have been friends for a number of years, and we're sort of inverse images of each other because my natural default is Article One, and his natural default is Article Two. And I think that Bill honestly believes that I uh, you need this Uber presidency today. It's it's not just, and I think you're absolutely right. This idea that the legislative branch is becoming simply ineffectual but also the idea that we're living in a dangerous world. And I think that people like Barr uh, truly believe that you need a president that can act unilaterally. Isn't I don't that agree in and with of that. itself a great danger to the entire I, I think it is, and this is why uh, lunches with us are horrible. And, um, <laughs> you know, because I, I don't agree. I think that actually the expanded executive branch is a danger in itself. But let, me take, let me just take a moment now to identify ourselves for radio, television, internet, those people carrying the Kalb Report. This is the Kalb Report, I'm Marvin Kalb, and we're discussing the possibility or even the likelihood that the U.S. is now in a constitutional crisis, forgive me, with Pete Williams of NBC, Nita Totenberg of NPR, and Jonathan Turley of the George Washington University. And it's often said that if it weren't for the press, especially the work of the New York Times and the Washington Post, we would never have had a Watergate crisis and President Nixon might never have had to resign. Now whether that's right or wrong, the press certainly played a major role then during Watergate and is playing a major role now. And my question to the two reporters is, how well do you think the press is playing that role now, Nina? Well, I find myself in this awful position I, you know, never thought that there was, you know, there is obviously a limit to objectivity. You're not going to say, Mr. Hitler argues, on the other hand, that he, <laughs> you know, he needs to get rid of all these people. Um, but I never really expected that I would be writing sentences or reading sentences in the New York Times or hearing them on television or out of all of our mouths, like Mr. Trump maintains without foundation or without evidence or that is not true. I never had to say that. There always were other people who would say that, you know, who were the players. I didn't have to say that. And now? And now it makes me very uncomfortable to be in that position, but you can't let a blatant untruth go unchecked as a reporter. And oftentimes, if you're doing it on the fly, you, you have to do it yourself. I mean, in, interestingly, one of the guys I, who mentored me as a young reporter told me that during the McCarthy era, when we didn't have mm -hmm. internet, we didn't have anything, um, they began to realize, the press began to realize that McCarthy would go out, make a horrible allegation right on deadline, and they would reprint, you know, they would print it. That's exactly what he did. And they finally decided to have a tag team mm -hmm. to rebut it, you know, mm -hmm. to deal with it. They had to come up with something. <clears throat> and we are in the modern era of that, and I, I don't think we do it as well as we might. I don't know how Pete feels. Well, I think uh, you know Donald Trump is discovering that the uh, the press or the, the the media in general is very much a double-edged sword because I think there are many people who would say that it's the press, it's the media that made Donald Trump uh, and turned him into a public figure and uh, was mesmerized by his campaign, and now of course he has so we, shall we say somewhat less warm feelings about it. Um, but I also think that, uh, remember, you know, we, we, we are talking about the current impeachment crisis. We can't ignore the role of whistleblowers because the, the whole thing was turned around. It's, remember, it all started with the Mueller report, uh, and that quickly became ancient history, and now we're concerned about the Ukraine call, and that became, came to the fore because of a person who worked in the White House in, in the intelligence agencies who decided to blow the whistle. But, you know, the media, it seems to me, Anyway, it's divided into two worlds now. I mean, there, there's Fox and all of the little foxes, and they all support the president. 
matter what he says, it does. But let's be the, fair to Fox. There are two different Foxes. I, I'm appreciate that. I'm talking mostly about evening primetime Fox. Mm -hmm. But even during the day, that line runs through the broadcasting. I was there. I experienced it. The other part, the other world, is a world consisting or led by the Times, the Post, NPR, NBC, and they are covering the president. But it appears from the coverage as if they're being negative about the president because they're reporting what it is that he says and does. So at this particular point, the reporters seem to be stuck. And let me yeah. turn to you and ask you yeah. your opinion on I'm this. I'm not too sure that's fair in terms of dividing the world between Fox and everyone else. There are and channels the into Little Foxes. Uh, there are uh, cable channels uh, that are um, just thoroughly anti-Trump to a point of advocacy. Um, I, I agree with the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, uh, NBC have, have done, the CBS have done wonderful jobs and, and, and they've really risen to this occasion despite the uh, awful things that has been said by this president about the media. But it's also, I think, important to recognize that journalism has also some things that they have to answer for. I think there's a far greater amount of advocacy that we have seen in the media. Uh, people who are just openly arguing the case against Trump on the air. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. A lot of what Trump views as negative coverage is simply reporting Trump. And it's not biased reporting. But there is a lot of biased reporting out there now. And I can understand it. You have someone who attacks you every single day, who, who says things that are untrue. But on, you know, on a couple of the other cable channels, <coughs> I actually play a game and think, here's a new story. What's the most anti-Trump spin I can give this story? It's a game that I play. I won't mention which cable uh, station it is. <laughs> but it always turns out to be that spin. It always, I, and it's sort of a fun but disturbing game to play, you know. Well, let, let's pick up on that point. I once worked at CBS with a, an anchorman named Walter Cronkite. Some of you remember mm -hmm. him. And some probably don't. Yes. <laughs> I like that too. You know that Walter would end his broadcast with the phrase, and that's the way it is. 82% of the American people at that time believed Walter Cronkite when he said that. He was also regarded as the most trusted man in America. That's a reporter. Who today, which reporter today, which anchor person today is going to get a 15% or a 20% approval rating? Well, I don't know that there Pete, is one. Pete and I would. <laughs> you probably. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, do, I think point, there's, it's funny because I think millennials are a different <clears throat> breed. You know, in the mornings I blog, up, I, so I get up early and do, do the blog, uh, and, and then uh, I'll do my column for the newspapers. And so my kids will come down on the way to school, and they'll say, what are you writing on? And I'll say, well, I'm, I, there's an interesting story. And they'll always say the same thing. They'll say, well, is that true? Exactly and, my point. And I, it, what, they know we, you better, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But, no, I mean, the but, point the, is... funny thing, but the funny thing is, when I was their age, if Walter Cronkite said something, it was true. I never doubted anything right. on, the, a, on the media. But this is my all, point. We but there have... are all these other... When, when we were young, uh, <laughs> there were three networks, or maybe four. And, and, there, and there was a fairness doctrine. If you went over the line... You had, to, you had to give equal time or fair time to somebody else who had a different point of view. Uh, it wasn't perfect, a perfect system, but it was the system that existed then. Nina. Now there are dozens of cable and streaming, and God help you if you get on Twitter. I know, but my, my point here is, the larger point is, the public began to lose trust in the media before Donald Trump became president. Oh, yes. It began to go down starting in the 80s. Now, public trust is a hard thing to be restored. And again, I turn to the two reporters. What does the press, the media, whatever you want to call it, have to do today to restore some of the public trust, if it is possible at all? 
Well, I think there's one is a market force. Uh, the the you know the 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 market force shows that people want opinion. Uh, you know, there there's a reason that uh, that network you named is doing well, and MSNBC is doing well. It's because people turn to those places. You know, and we can discuss why, but the fact is it, they have been successful. So that's that's one thing, and maybe that affects credibility or not, I don't know. But in terms of trust, um, I think it's transparency. I think it's, it's uh, being willing to uh, explain how stories are gathered more, look a little bit behind the curtain, not to take the attitude of that's the way it is, here it is, take it or leave it, but invite the viewer in a little more to how we put stories together and why. And I think also, um, you know, there's a, remember, there's a good deal of this country. You don't see it much in Washington, D.C., but th there are people who elected this man president, and there are still a lot of Americans who support Donald Trump. And I guess one question that the news media should ask itself is, do we see that reflected, do we see the support for the president reflected in our daily news coverage adequately? And a question that comes up also, I think, is whether, the, this, whether everything is changing so rapidly now, not just the means of communication, but our societies, everything is changing so rapidly. Does the role of the press change in this changing world? And if it does change, how does it change? Does it become, or should it become, a kind of teacher as well as just a reporter? Yes. You're reporting the facts, but teach them something in addition. Yes, and I think, you know, this is a theme that's, that has well been chewed over, but the fact is, when Walter presided over the evening news, it was a national hearth. We all came together, and we all sort of basically had the same information. Now, in terms of millennials, too, you know, you, you set your phone so that you get soccer scores and uh, scuba diving lessons and uh, tuna fish recipes. And you sort of <laughs> filter out only the things that, you know, filter out things and, and modify it, it to concentrate only on what you're interested in. So, yes, uh, as civics education is withering away in the schools, you know, I think we do have to do that. We do have to explain how the government works because... You know, Jonathan knows what Article 1 and 2 uh, are, but I suspect most Americans don't know what he's talking about when he says Article 1 and 2. Well, I, you know, I think that anybody who has watched TV at all about some of these issues has seen Pete Williams over the years walk Age. a, walk a <laughs> completely straight line and not fall for the the pit here and the pit there, and people understand that. They appreciate it. They know it. They know he's not just a sucker for either side. And I actually think people know that about NPR too. Yeah, they may hate some of our story choices from time to time, so do I. But, uh, but they know that about something that they really care about, they're gonna get some, a lot of information and that by and large, leaves it to them to decide what they think. And I think, for example, we did that actually during the campaign. We, every week we had, we had wonderful, interesting conversations with Trump voters. And, but we are all under enormous deadline pressure. There are so many platforms that we're all responsible for. And none of us is uh, perfect. It, navigating this all the time. Even if you're considerably younger and faster at it than I am and can do every, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all the social media stuff and the, and the podcast and the digital story and the radio story or the TV story, just the, the vast fire hose of information. We're gonna get you a raise. <laughs> We're going to get you a raise. Marvin, just, Jonathan, to point out, just a, a small point, just to reinforce what you just said. When we do these stories that are sort of what I would call explainers, you know, how does impeachment work? Mm -hmm. How does a bill become law? Whatever. They're very popular. They Good. do well. They succeed. They get eyeballs. So that suggests that there is an appetite for this. Good. I want to turn to you, Jonathan, and ask you um, uh, 
I'm going to say to help us, but let me just put it in a personal way, to help me. Um, President Trump has used the expression fake news more than 600 times since yeah. he's come in. And he has made it an international favorite among autocrats. He himself, according to the Washington Post, has lied to the American, I'm using that verb that you did not use before. <laughs> the president, according to the Post, has lied or misled the public thousands of times. Kellyanne Conway speaks about alternative facts rather than facts alone are inadequate. And what, what puzzles me is how are the American people to deal with this fake world that they're now being presented with? How do people respond properly in a democracy to this kind of political leadership? Well, I think all of this uh, fits into uh, it's sort of an aggregation of a problem. Uh, and I don't want to, to leave the media off the hook in, in this. You I know think, why. Yeah, I think that we do live in a world of echo journalism. And people now, as Pete said, they tailor their news. They have very little patience with hearing anything but the news they want to hear. And so what Pete said is absolutely correct, that these, these advocacy-type journalism platforms do do well. The problem is that I think that we have, the media has contributed to the problem in that you see more advocacy aspects of journalists. They do go on MSNBC and Fox. These are regular journalists. And they do sound more like opinion pieces. And so this line is, is blurring. And in my area, that's also the case with legal analysts. I've been a legal analyst uh, for 30 years. and. I always used to joke that in my next life I wanted to come back as a political analyst because you don't have to be right. And, um, you know, but, you know, I really, maybe it's because I'm a law professor as well, I really do strive to get it right, you know, but. But reporters strive to get it right also. But I'm beginning to see with legal analysts and with some reporters um, this advocacy aspect, this opinion aspect. Is, is I think overwhelming their judgment. And I'll, this is an example in terms of legal analysts. You know, in the last two years, there has been a lot of really bad legal analysis where the people have been told things that are not true, uh, that crimes are clearly established, uh, that impeachable offenses are established, when there were critical flaws. But that's not what the, that site wanted to hear. And so you have re lawyers who go on and they say, oh my God, this is just a slam dunk. It's a bombshell. It's, it's all of this. And so I don't blame the public for if they hear only that, of course they're angry when they go to another site like NPR and they hear someone speaking in a balanced way and saying, well, you know, there, there might be some problems with this. Yeah, well, right. What do the people do? That's the point of my question. You're describing it very well and I totally agree. But at the end of the day, the American people, I think many parts of the world, in fact, are left in a very awkward position. How do you adjust to a fake world? How do we, um, as journalists, help the American public adjust to a fake world? And how can you deal with a fake world in a democracy? That's the part of it that I don't truly understand, and I need help. Well, there really is fake news. And you can find it on the internet every day. Um, as everybody probably knows here, there's a notorious case during the 2016 election of a man who was persuaded that a restaurant here in Washington had a basement right. full of children who were being abused and that had something to do with Hillary Clinton. And a man from West Virginia got a gun and came here and was going to shoot somebody. And, and there uh, wasn't even a basement. Right, there was uh, no basement. Which he, is really he, <laughs> was, he was wrong in every respect. Yeah. Uh, and he was arrested and convicted. That's fake news. Uh, there is a, a lot of fake news out there. And uh, you know, you're, you're sort of asking a question of how do we help people be better consumers? Really, okay. that's what it is. And how do we do that? And the how, do you, how do you manage to establish what is a fact when it is so difficult when there's a counterfact? There's a legal argument, and then there's a counter 
legal argument. You don't live in a world that is rooted in a single universally accepted truth. Everyone appears to have his or her own truth. And in that kind of environment, I am puzzled, truly. When you look into the future about the strength of our democracy, how do we manage in that kind of world? Well, I think, I think we are at an exceptionally uh, 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 challenging. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, even at the time. Way. And I suspect that uh, the years ahead, it won't be so bad. Uh, but um, how do we know that, Whitman? Well, we how don't do we... know that, but 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 uh, that's my guess. That's my guess, and that's I my think hope, to some anyway. my, uh, yes, our hope, all our hopes. I think it, to some extent it, it will be somewhat self curative. It will be somewhat self, you know, it will heal you itself. You mean that we bit. will go back to the good times when Trump is but, gone? But remember, remember, mm -hmm. uh, you know. In newspapers, as just even before you were a journalist, Marvin, newspapers. We don't go were, back that far. Well, we're going to because this is the press club. They were called and pamphlets. That's what we do. Then. It was <laughs> terribly partisan. Mm -hmm. Newspapers were incredibly partisan. It, they still are to some extent in the UK. There still are in many parts of the world. And so you read the paper that reflected your views. You read the Guardian, or you read the Independent, or you read the Times of London. Um, and so th this isn't a new phenomenon of people seeking out information that they find th that they're more comfortable with. Uh, and th but there are news organizations that try to uh, rise above that, if you will, or try to be less partisan. And uh, I just think, again, it's, it's, giving, it's making people understand that there is a place for that. The concern for me, it really is technology. Um, the time will come where it's going to be very difficult to be able to tell a fake video. And that can cause enormous problems, not just for individuals and how we vote and how we think, but for governments. And <laughs> knocking down a fake, genuinely fake story. And there always are people who are either devoted to screwing up the works to use a legal term, <coughs> or um, they're venal, or they're crazy. And if you give those people those tools, that's why that, I have to say, is what, well, it worries me. I, I would like to think that Pete is right, and I certainly hope he's right, and that we will find counter ways of dealing with AI and all of that. But I, it worries me. The, um now I'm going to call you professor, if I may. Um, we have all been told, and you said it yourself in this program and earlier today up on the Hill, that we're in a very tough time now. You acknowledge that. But you also say that we have been in tough times before. We've had a civil war. We've had the election in 1820. We've had difficult times before. And we always seem to emerge from those times. And we are capable of restoring the goodness and the soul of America. Um, so I hear you and I understand that that is a very hopeful and very nice <laughs> attitude to have. The question in my mind is I'm not sure that I believe what I'm about to say, <laughs> but I really am puzzled by it. Supposing it doesn't go that way, supposing that President Trump is an anomaly to the unusual president of the past and manages to create what one columnist just this past week called an electoral dictatorship. In other words, that using the tools of the White House in the expanded power that it has today, do you see a possibility that we may get to that time when the president has so much power, call him Trump or Jones, that he continues to accumulate power and then the Congress can't do anything, press can't do very much except ape pretty much what he says. What do you think? Well, I, you know, when people talk about an, an electorate dictatorship, I call it democracy and you don't <laughs> like, you know, pe the, the thing, well, the, the, the thing is that we all speak in different parts of the country. And when you get out of Washington, when you go west, 
you know, and you definitely move west beyond St. Louis, you hear a very different view of people. And I think that uh, um, there is this sense that we're in this crisis because these people are still voting for Trump. You know, the needle is not moving on impeachment that significantly. It moved about six points. It's not that significant. It's a, we're divided about 50% in the country down either way. And when you go west from St. Louis, those people aren't maniacs. But you often hear in coverage the sort of view. It's like that. Remember that old New Yorker uh, cover that showed uh, the map of the United States and the view of the New Yorker, which was New York City, then a vast wasteland, and then San Francisco? Um, there actually are people between those two spots. And they don't agree. They don't view Trump this way. And, and I, I'm intrigued by it because I didn't support Trump, and I still don't. Um, but, but, John, but, but I Jonathan, think part of it is that they wanted a disruptor. Um, it's not necessarily that they like Trump. I think they really th found a way to disrupt Washington. Oh, but you John, know that we've, my do, one question to you, though, is if these two forces won't talk to each other, and yeah. have no commonality. How do you get to yes ever? That is a terrific transition for me. Go for because it. Because I'm going to do that. <laughs> because I mean, in the nature of the of the press president relationship, through which, by the way, a lot of our reality is seen, this fractured relationship between presidents and the press really goes back to colonial times. Right? You were suggesting that earlier. But our founding fathers thought enough of the press and the freedom of the press to guarantee that freedom in the First Amendment to the US Constitution. Freedom of the press has always been, I think we could all agree, a fundamental pillar in American democracy. I've learned over the years, in fact, that when that freedom is jeopardized, our democratic structure is weakened. And at pivotal moments in our history, we might we might have asked ourselves, what is truly important to us? What are our legitimate rights? Are we prepared to fight for those rights? What are we entitled to expect of a president? The man who hired me many years ago, Edwin R. Murrow of CBS, spoke eloquently to these questions in a March 9, 1954 broadcast about Senator Joseph McCarthy and the political crisis that he had launched. Please listen carefully and change only one name. Earlier, the senator asked, upon what meat does this our Caesar feed? Had he looked three lines earlier in Shakespeare's Caesar, he would have found this line, which is not altogether inappropriate. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. No one familiar with the history of his country can deny that congressional committees are useful. It is necessary to investigate before legislating. But the line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one, and the junior senator from Wisconsin has stepped over it repeatedly. His primary achievement has been in confusing the public mind as between the internal and the external threats of communism. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. We must remember always that accusation is not proof and that conviction depends upon evidence and due process of law. We will not walk in fear one of another. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason if we dig deep in our history and our doctrine. And remember that we are not descended from fearful men, not from men who feared to write, to speak, to associate, and to defend the causes that were for the moment unpopular. This is no time for men who oppose Senator McCarthy's methods to keep silent, or for those who approve. We can deny our heritage and our history, but we cannot escape responsibility for the result. There is no way for a citizen of a republic to abdicate his responsibilities. As a nation, we have come into our full inheritance at a tender age. We proclaim ourselves as indeed we are, the defenders of freedom wherever it continues to exist in the world. But we cannot defend freedom abroad by deserting it at home. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad. 
and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create this situation of fear. He merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Good night, and good luck. Whether that was Murrow in 1954 or us here in 2019, when there is a challenge to American democracy, it seems our joint responsibility to rise in its defense, appreciating the freedoms we derive from the U.S. Constitution. These freedoms are not fake news. They do not lie. Our democracy is a precious thing, but on occasion, fragile. If our freedoms are perceived to be endangered, as now seems to be the case, then it is certainly time to stand up and be heard loud and clear enough. And to the many young journalists in our audience, that is your challenge in our time. Go to it. And that is it for now. My thanks go to our audience here at the National Press Club, everywhere else that the Cal Report is heard and seen, and my thanks especially to our terrific panel, our wonderfully bright, articulate panel, Nina Totenberg of NPR, Pete Williams of NBC, and Professor Jonathan Turley of the George Washington University. I'm Marvin Kalb, and as Ed Murrow used to say many years ago, good night and good luck. <laughs>
is that he loves to kind of govern by confusion and chaos. And I guess this is part of question, part of plea. Um, what we need from the media to, to get after fake, fake news and to help figure out what the truth is, is to have more explicit coverage of what he's actually doing, not what the latest tweet is, and not what he's saying, and know how to find Thank the you. bright, shiny things. Thank you. We did make an attempt to answer that question before. Professor Turley, would you like to try? Oh, I, I, I have nothing to disagree with in that. I think that uh, the media has already served that function, I think, brilliantly. I, I'm critical of some aspects of the media um, and, because I believe that they are fueling uh, the distrust for the media by being advocates uh, more than journalists. But there still remains the <coughs> core of, of really good journalists uh, that report fairly. Um, and I do think that there's an appetite for that. I've actually changed my view of millennials. Maybe it's because I have a couple. But um, uh, you know, they strike me as a really interesting generation. And I, I, they're very skeptical. You know, um, more than we were. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, but I think that that skepticism leads them uh, to mainstream media. Um, and so I, I guess I'm more optimistic. But I am worried about the sort of journalistic China syndrome. You know, I just gave a speech in Buenos Aires um, and met with some journalism students. And it left me depressed for about a month because these were these really bright, wonderful young journalists. And, um, and they were really well aware of everything. And I asked them what their plans were. And they said that in Buenos Aires, the only way to figure out the news is you had to buy three newspapers and put them side by side and read them together. Um, and that for them to get a job, they have to basically take that viewpoint. And it's sort of the China syndrome of what we're talking about, that is if this thing accelerates, if we have this echo journalism accelerate, we're going to end up in this position of echo journalism and no real journalism. Um, and I'm hoping we won't get that. But I, I think that there's more of a tradition and appetite in the United States for solid mainstream media. I, I really do. Yes, please. Oh, good evening. My name is Charles Halfish, and I'm not affiliated with anything. I'm just a fan of the Cobb Report. <laughs> but early on, Nina made the comment that the uh, middle, the moderate Republicans and the uh, conservative Democrats don't exist anymore. And I'd like to ask the other panelists if they agree with that. Or do they feel that that, let's say, silent majority has been left behind by the media who is focused too much on the extreme left and extreme right? I didn't say they don't exist. I said they don't exist in Congress. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, I think that's, uh, that's true. Uh, we were talking before. Um, when I was doing, uh, when I was lead defense counsel in the last impeachment trial, which was for a judge, I had occasion to, when we broke the, in the middle of the trial on the Senate floor and, and Senator Inouye uh, came down and said, what's it like to argue a case on the Senate floor as opposed to a courtroom? And I said, you know, it's funny, it doesn't bother me as much as what I see, because I was a congressional page at the age of 14, and I, I adore Congress. And I said, I just keep on, as I argue to this jury, most of whom I would strike for cause, um, including a couple of senators who were under investigation when they were, when they were voting on my client. Um, but I said, they all look really small. I remember I came on there, giants used to be on this floor, the Moynihans and the Humphreys. And there's not any of those. And this goes to what Nina said. It's not just about this sort of political division, right? It, they're just smaller people uh, now. And I don't know how you handle it, but for the first time, anyway, was an incredibly positive man. And that's the only time I ever saw him sort of s sad. And he, he said, I think about that every time I come on this floor. And I don't know how we change that, how we pick better people. Well, we, the, there, Marvin, uh, again, I apologize for my youthful optimism here, but. Uh, um, <laughs> I meant that. I meant that sarcastically to myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Nina and I both cover the Supreme Court, where we've seen the Supreme Court rule against uh, attempts to rule 
redistricting, partisan gerrymandering. The Supreme Court has said, look, that's, how do we know? It's a partisan process. How do we know when it becomes too partisan? We're not going to touch that. So what have we seen? Well, that's a federal ruling on the federal constitution. And what we've seen is two things happening. Number one, many states experimenting now with re nonpartisan redistricting commissions or uh, litigation under state laws, saying, okay, it may, it may, you can't, maybe you can't touch it under the federal constitution, but let's look at it under the state constitution. And that's starting to happen now. So, I mean, the reason Congress is so partisan, much the Senate, I had the same experience, I worked in the Senate as a, as a staffer in the, in the mid-70s, is because of the people, the places that elect them are so partisan. House districts are either all Republican or all Democrat. You don't have, the reason you don't have so many moderate members is you don't have so many moderate districts. And, and so there are trends and the, and the, in the other people, direction. And people are worried only, mainly about being primary. They're not worried about the general election. I think it's true, yeah. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Emma Edelman, and I'm here as a citizen tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, so you mentioned millennials, and quick point, millennials are people from 1980 to 1996, and so teenagers in early 20s would be Gen Z. Don't blame it all on us, we're not terrible. <laughs> Thank you teenagers in this room, what you do. Um, so you mentioned social media. Social media has changed the game in a lot of ways, and also created self-selection. And I think almost everyone mentions social media tonight as a huge force and the self-selection of who's sending you a notification, what's going on. So how do you see that continuing to pivot for the media as we go into the 2020 election and covering this? Thank you. Good. Who would like to try that? Nita, you want to try it? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, I am neither a millennial nor a Gen Xer. In case you didn't know. Uh, I did know that your kids are not millennials, but I wasn't. Well, actually, kid. one is. Actually. <laughs> one yeah, is. And, one, and they do correct me and say two of our Gen Zs. But I, I don't, it, because I'm really not as tech savvy as people that age, I can't, I, I really don't, I'm not the right person. Um, here's where I'm not so optimistic. Uh, the experience of reading a newspaper is you sit down and you turn the pages and mm -hmm. you think, oh, I had no idea that the zebras were being threatened at Zanzibar. Uh, and you find yourself reading that story because right. it comes at you. You don't, it just sort of, there it is. Uh, whereas in social media, two things are true. One is you can filter the news. But secondly, um, what, what you find is, uh, we had a meeting with our social media people the other day who said that the average social media <laughs> person, the average consumer of the news, looks at say. the stories that we struggle over for hours and hours and for honing, how many seconds? honing, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's less than a minute is the amount of time they spend looking at our stories. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can get them to read all the way to the end, it's like you know the Handel's Messiah. So, uh, <laughs> I, I I really do worry about that. I mean, I'm, look, I, I I am a child of my past. I realize, but I think the experience of reading a newspaper is a wonderful thing, and I worry desperately that it's going out of style. Well, I think that's, I, I, I did speak once with David Savage, a wonderful journalist, and we were asked, um, what's, the, uh, what's the future of, 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 of print? And I'm coming in from it on the columnist side, but he's a real journalist. And, uh, and he said, let me handle this. And he said, I'm a three-time loser. Said my my uh, grandfather was a coal miner when the coal mines closed. My father was a steel worker when the steel mills closed, and I write for a newspaper, <laughs> um, which I think is a, just a great line. Yeah. And unfortunately, but the other thing I think that was so valuable what what Pete said is, and this is what's missing is this discovery element to a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. My wife is one of the last people I know that actually reads a paper newspaper. She's had to go through incredible efforts to get one. Um, you know, it's They'll bring it to your to, house, you know. They will bring it to your but, house. But, but I mean, it's, 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 much, it's very expensive, and, it's, and, and, and a lot of them are, anyway. a lot of papers are, 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 are pulling out of print. And I think what Pete says is actually the most valuable thing, is that when you think about it, when you read a newspaper, 90% of the real new news was accidental. Right, you you ran across it, and that's not happening. I think people are now it's tailored news. And what will the world be like without a newspaper? Think about that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
hard to imagine a world without a newspaper. My name is Flora Barth Wolf. I come from Philadelphia these days, and I'm a retired lawyer and judge. I want to ask a question of Professor Turley because really what I want to do is scream, but I don't want to be cut off from making a speech. You talked about people in the West and in a, out, of, out of our bubble, not necessarily geographically West alone, <coughs> liking Trump because they wanted a disruptor. I want to pose the question, what if that disruption, as we frequently see him use it, is really a dog whistle for racism, for people who are scared that they can't be coal miners, they can't be steel workers, and maybe they can't be the majority race. And dear God, what do we do about that? What do newspapers do about that? Well, first of all, you can cover it and, and, and state it as well as you just did. I mean, what you just did was, was uh, objective. And I think that uh, that's a valid thing for people to explore. I think that though people, part of the pre problem that we're having in this country is that there is not just no dialogue anymore between two halves of this country, but increasingly there is no comprehension between the two. I mean, people that I know view Trump supporters um, as like they're from another planet. And they all can't be these drooling racists responding to dog whistles. There's too many of them. It's about 50% of the country. So the question is, what's going on? Why are so many people still supportive? And why isn't that needle moving? You know? And I think it's a mix of different things. Now, yeah, there, I think there may be, it's, I think there are, is some racism involved in this mix, but that can't be all of it. I just don't believe it is. I think a lot of them did want- There are too want, many Obama voters who became Trump voters. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, I think when I talk to people about Trump, I get a lot of people that are just, let me put it this way, what some of us see on the news that horrifies us, Right when Trump comes out and just blasts away what you know, was going to be on evening news that night, uh, and and you know there's this pause that you see on all the networks of just yeah, and then and then people start to speak. Um, there are a lot of people that don't really care what the cause of that was. What they're seeing is the disrupting of Washington D.C. And there is a huge amount of alienation among people I talk to with Washington and with the media with, that they associate with Washington. And so it's not that they like what he's saying or agree with what he's saying. I think that a lot of people really like the impact of what he's, he's doing. I don't, I don't. But I don't know how we resolve this so that we can actually understand each other again. I've never been more worried in my life about, I'm actually a pretty optimistic person. I haven't liked any president in my lifetime. The last <laughs> president I liked was James Madison. <laughs> I, so I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't like any of them, okay? But what scares the hell out of me is that once I move past St. Louis, it's like a different country. What happened to you in St. Louis? Yeah, what do you have against? <laughs> It was past St. Louis, Nina. Past St. Louis. And what do you have against Lincoln? <laughs> We've only got time, unfortunately, for one more question, and it has to come here. Yeah. I'm very sorry. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, my name is Bob Wiedemer. I write books, uh, and uh, what was the other thing I was supposed to say? Oh, write books, uh, and I'm a press club member. Uh, this question is actually for Marvin, and I'm going to key off what. Uh, Everard Murrow said in that classic report on McCarthy, um, do you feel that a lot of what's going on, perhaps, in what we talked about tonight and with the press <coughs> reflects more a, a very fundamental change in America, I mean, long-term change in, in the people, and that will reflect in the press and the press we support, in, in that we've sort of gone from what I call Roosevelt's America to Nixon's America. In other words, is there a, 
a fundamental trend out there beyond Trump, beyond individuals, beyond press problems or technology or partisanship. We've certainly had civil wars yeah. and all that. So well, I, is there a fundamental change going on that's affecting all this? That was the point of one of the questions that I asked Jonathan. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that there are very smart people who write books, who lecture, who say that we are at a pivot point and that Trump is simply not just another president, but he has populist instincts and he comes along at a time when the world is changing, technologically, politically, in many different ways. And he is, as Murrow said about another politician, exploiting these issues. If at the end of the day, that exploitation leads to a meaningful change in the nature of our presidency and therefore our democracy, then the fear that I have will be realized. However, however, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I try to be an optimist. <laughs> and I say that we have, as a nation, emerged out of difficult times. And there are many people in this country who think good things, not just bad things. There are terrific journalists around in this country who do marvelous, indispensable work. So where are we going to go? I don't know, but I just have this gut feeling that we're at a pivot point and we could go in either direction. At which point, let me say thank you to all of you who have come here and to celebrate our 100th birthday. And I invite you back for the next 100 years Come, be our guests. <laughs> Thanks again to our panel, and God bless you all.